Okay, hello, good evening. Um, once again, welcome to this lecture series, um, Knowledge in the Making Towards an Intellectual History of uh, Early Modern Malta. I'm Jean Paul De Luca from the Department of Philosophy. And uh, this lecture series, as you probably know, is a collaboration between the department and um, the national libraries. Um, so thanks also to the co conveners. Um, uh, Mavericks Kateri and uh, Maroma Khabilderi and Michelle Wajar and other, other members of the staff of the National Library. Um, this is the third lecture in this series um, that will run till May 2024. And um, we're very happy this evening to have with us Dr. Ruben Grima from the Department of uh, um, Conservation and uh, Built Heritage, sorry, um, and the Faculty of Built Environment. Um, Dr. Grima is uh, an archaeologist with a very long experience in uh, in uh, cultural heritage, heritage mode, etc. But this, this evening's talk, uh, which is on the intellectual milieu of uh, Giovanni Francesco Abella's Descrizione di Malta, is a builds on his uh, um, recent fellowship in. Uh, in Rome, and it fits very nicely with the broad theme of this uh, lecture series where we're looking at different aspects of um, Malta's intellectual history in the early modern period. And by intellectual history, we mean the very broad understanding of uh, the interface uh, between different disciplines, mainly focused on the transfer and communication of knowledge that looks at ideas, people, works, books, um, in their different contexts, and the different layers of context. And um, uh, I'm looking forward, and I'm sure that we're all looking forward to listening to um, Dr. Grima's lecture on the different layers, different contexts of uh, Abela's intellectual media. Thank you. Well, good evening, all. Uh, thank you for coming out and uh, braving the traffic to, to join us this evening in this uh, extraordinary uh, space. It's a great privilege to be with you here this evening and I'm immensely grateful to all the organizers uh, of this series for this possibility of sharing some ideas uh, with you this evening. The subject this evening, the central character, is this gentleman, uh, which I'm sure practically all of you will have heard of many times in the past, and some uh, know very well, and some might, might even be wondering, uh, John Francesco Abela again, what more is there left to say about him? I'll try to uh, tease out some angles to this, which hopefully by the end of this hour, if you're thinking that, you'll uh, be thinking of it uh, a little differently. This portrait is actually at the back of this room in that corner, and I'm very grateful to Michel Bahajar for going to great lengths to take this picture, which is rather better than the, the one I had. Now, most of us encounter Abela as school children through the book, the principal book that he publishes, which is this description of Malta, which is the first detailed historical account and description of the Maltese archipelago, published in 1647. And it's even the frontispiece that we see there is such an immensely familiar image. Every school child is exposed to this, even at the junior college in both the current mural and one before it, because the junior college is named after Giovanni Francesco Abela. Uh, you see both him and the uh, uh, frontispiece of this book. So it's so familiar, we hardly give it a second thought. And it's one of the things I'll be uh, trying to unpack in a moment. This is a, a very quick timeline. Uh, Abela distinguishes himself very early on. He um, is uh, highly acclaimed during his studies in Bologna at the start of the 17th century. 
He serves in the diplomatic service for the order on various important missions. He gets promoted to vice chancellor, which is comparable to the, the, the role of first minister or prime minister in, in modern terms. So an immensely influential uh, role. And uh, he is also instrumental. He's one of the three people entrusted with the election of uh, Jean-Paul Lascaris. And uh, his uh, antiquarian academic pursuits are all on top of that. So he's a very busy man. And uh, uh, the research that he conducts uh, throughout the first half of the 17th, 17th century culminates in this book, which is after he has withdrawn from public life in 1640, which makes it a bit easier to, to concentrate on writing it up. And so much has been written about him, mostly praise, but also some criticism. And one very even handed, balanced assessment, which I went back to recently, was written by Anthony Latrell in 1977. And I'm just going to bring up three short quotes from it. I promise there won't be many quotes uh, after this, but uh, it really sums up. To begin with, he is the father of Maltese history and Maltese his historiography. And uh, that is a place which he can never lose. His uh, contribution is so titanic in inventing and giving form to Maltese history that we will always all stand on his shoulders. And Latrell is here clearly acknowledging this. But then there's also a lot of discourse and this in the 1960s and 1970s became quite an important co uh, conservation, conversation on how some of the misconceptions of the past continue to color later generations of work. And the tone in the 1970s and into the 1980s was that we need to be careful in our reading of Abela and we need to filter off some of these legends and biases and misconceptions to get to the actual facts, to the true history, to the truth. Yeah, this was very much the paradigm. And uh, part of the task of the historian was presented as this filtering, which is absolutely true, of course. We need to understand problems of bias and uh, go back to earlier sources uh, when possible. However, there is also another angle to this, that the process of making up the past, of giving form to the past, of deploying the past in a, a current social context is also worthy of study in its own right. And uh, from the 1980s onwards, there's been a burgeoning literature on the importance of reading history uh, in context. In so, in a nutshell, what I'm going to try to do today can be divided into these uh, three points. So I'm trying to shift from a focus on where was Abela factually right and factually wrong, and trying to measure his uh, interpretations with uh, our much more privileged standpoint today, and to shift away from that and look rather at how in his social context was the fabrication, construction, interpretation of the past diverging or converging from the other researchers and members of the public and uh, received wisdom that he was surrounded by? And what was he trying to do in this? How was he positioning himself? Which is an interesting and important question in its own right. Reading Latrell again, in the quote uh, you just saw in 1977, he was already pointing the way in this direction, noting that this is an important angle. But as a medievalist, he was more interested in 
filtering away the um, less precise interpretations and get at the um, better founded, better documented um, narratives. Now, what I will also do in uh, the third point is to try to tease out some of the evidence, both from correspondence and some of it unpublished correspondence with some of his contemporaries, and also some of the visual culture of the time, how images were playing a part in these uh, larger ideas and preconceptions about the past, and how he himself may have deployed some of this. Okay, so that's the agenda for the next 40 minutes. This is the image we had in the title page, which I'm sure most of you recognize. It's uh, a detail of a larger image. It's easier, easier to recognize now, I think. Yeah? Most of you will have recognized this. And this is published uh, a century after Abela is on the go. But it is heavily influenced by an event which happened in Abela's day. So it's um, uh, published by Van der Rahn, the early 18th century, and it shows a highly stylized and idealized uh, vision of Ari Gubir. And it's largely inspired by a visit of one of Ape by one of Abela's <coughs> contemporaries, which uh, he, uh, Athanasius Kircher, who we'll meet in a moment, publishes in the late 17th century, many decades after this visit uh, took place in 1637. And the reason I'm starting with that image is it always reminded me, as a child, I had a children's encyclopedia. And one of the images was this, which you might say has absolutely nothing to do with uh, the, the image we just saw of the troglodyte community at Ar el -Gabir. This is a much more famous image, world famous image, which shows a uh, turning point in uh, the history of humanity in, 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 in the past millennium, which is the moment when uh, Columbus uh, sets foot on uh, what he called uh, Hispaniola, which is now Haiti and the Dominican Republic. And uh, as a child, I used to spend hours looking through this encyclopedia and, and, and seeing this image. And it was only later that I realized that even to look at these images, one is immediately implicated in a whole game of power and uh, uh, the power of the gaze and inequality. The artist here is representing the world very much as the people on the left are uh, seeing and understanding the world. And the discourse of the picture immediately convinces us that they are somehow innately superior and destined to dominate the world, that the inequality is almost a natural order of things. And although this is a hundred years before the uh, uh, image by Van der Rahe of the um, uh, Aval Gbir, you will see that some of the same tensions and inequalities and conventions are also in at play here. You know? And uh, uh, both form parts of pictorial encyclopedias of the world, which are meant to illustrate the exotic and the other and the unfamiliar, and even to exaggerate the, how exotic the other is. So a simple image like this can be such a powerful vehicle for forming ideas about how, about human relationships and difference and um, inequality. And it is part of the backdrop against which Abela is also working.
I'll just throw in another example, and you may or may not agree with this, but you could argue that there is some of the same thing uh, going on here. This is uh, when Abel is a young man, yeah? that this, this is the church rebuilt by Arofda Winyakur at St. Paul's Bay when he needed to build a defensive tower on the site of the existing medieval church uh, dedicated to one of the most iconic events in uh, Maltese myth-making and identity and, and, and the, the narrative of St. Paul's arrival ashore uh, as, as described in the Acts. And uh, the representation of the Maltese, you can see the Grand Master has inserted himself on the left of the frame and possibly the artist Casarinos behind him. But uh, to the right there, we see some of the natives. And one of them is even wearing a turban. So there is this suggestion of uh, the Oriental, African, different, in addition to the uh, term barbarian, which we have, um, uh, the barbaroi, which we have in the uh, account from the Acts. Okay. So even here, we have conceptions about the Maltese population being projected visually. And these are very, very powerful tombs which um, shape the way people think, even if it is not being articulated verbally. And just to bring in another thread here, staying with uh, uh, the same Grand Master, and of the Winyakur in the uh, early 17th century, this image comes from a what's called a Liber Amicorum, uh, compiled by an antiquarian in Rome who was producing the, uh, engravings and descriptions of the antiquities of Rome. And his marketing strategy was to send out copies to different princes ac across Europe, to gift them, and say, I have this other publication project coming up. This is a gift, but any help you can give would be gratefully accepted and uh, you'll be one of the first to receive a copy. And usually this strategy uh, worked quite well. And they sent him bags of silver, gold, and other gifts which sponsored his activity. One of the very few times on record in the whole the, uh, manuscript, which is preserved in the British School at Rome uh, library, was when he uh, tried this technique with Grand Master Munyakur. And you can see the reply that he received. Uh, Thank you for this. However, in this grave age, we don't really have time for this sort of thing. Okay? Here, we are in the serious business of defending Christendom against the infidel. And books are for sissies, basically. So it's quite saying it. And, <laughs> and, so, and um, it's not clear if he sent the volume back or not, but he doesn't seem to have sent any funding. The, the reason I bring this up is, again, about the mindset, because this is a recurring theme. I've come across very similar statements even at the turn of the 18th century, where an, another researcher is complaining that on this island people only have taught for war and the curation of archaeology and the past is a luxury they have no time for. And so this is a deeply embedded idea and it's also feeding into the way the island and its population is being constructed as the same way that we saw in the Van der Rahe engraving and in uh, Kirker's uh, description of that cave, there's this tendency to exoticize, to make more different and remote. And uh, in this case, the idea of um, being uh, outremer, being in beyond Europe and uh, in uh, the territory of the Crusades, yeah, because ultimately these are lost Latter-day uh, Crusaders, is feeding into their construction of 
and their idea of Maltese geography and identity as somewhere more remote and uncouth and different to Europe. And this is the background against which Abela emerges. This is why I'm teasing. Now, to take this further, I, I need to introduce a few characters. Okay? Quick cast of characters. Fabio Chigi, one of the most distinguished um, inquisitors to serve in Malta, who is here from uh, 34, 1634 to 1639, and who eventually becomes one of the most extraordinary popes of the 17th century. Yeah? He's left his mark. You just need to stand in, in uh, the space in front of St. Peter's and you see his name as Pope Alexander VII plastered on the Bernini colonnade everywhere. And that's just one of uh, several sites around Rome. Now it's important to be aware that he's not just an inquisitor, not just a cleric, but also a first-class scholar and researcher. When he's 19, he writes in, in Latin an important description of his grandfather's brother's uh, house, palace, which today we know as the Farnesina, opposite uh, in Trastevere, just across the Tiber from uh, Palazzo Farnese. That is originally built as uh, the, the, the house of uh, Agostino Chigi, an important banker who even used to bankroll Pope Julius II, an immensely powerful man, and a collateral ancestor of um, uh, Fabio Chigi. And at the age of 19, he's writing a scholarly account, which is still the most, it's just been republished recently, as you see there. Uh, it's the most important reference work to understand the history of that house. So these are quite uh, titanic uh, figures. <coughs> He's also a very, very thorough uh, diarist. He writes all the important meetings that, uh, and even less important things uh, on a daily basis in uh, minuscule notebooks. They're, they're, they're that size and, and the letters are about the size of a small ant. You know, they're like, three millimeters high, but still uh, quite legible. And uh, in this entry, for instance, we see the moment that he's going to the headquarters of the Inquisition at Santa Maria Sopra Minerva, just behind the Pantheon, where the previous year, as you, you may remember, this is where Galileo had had his trial. Okay? This is the world that he, um, forms part of. And he writes, on the 11th hour, I was uh, at the offices of the Inquisition to get his final briefing before being sent out to Malta. And his boss is Cardinal Francesco Barberini. This is the man he answers to, who's the Cardinal nephew, uh, the nephew of Pope Urban VIII, you know, the, the Maffeo Barberini who is the man who, in the end, uh, is uh, responsible for the uh, trial of uh, Galileo. Yeah? So. And shortly after Kiji's arrival in Malta, he has a fairly peaceful first year, but then the, the bane of his life turns up, and it's this young German prince who uh, and, uh, is sent out, he is converts to Catholicism and is sent out to Malta in 1637 because he has these romantic notions about becoming a knight of St. John. And it's one of the reasons that he got attracted to Catholicism. And because he's a, uh, you know, the son of an important prince in, of one of the principalities uh, in Germany, having him convert to Catholicism is a big coup for the papacy and for Cardinal Barberini. And uh, it's a project, it becomes a pet project for um, Francesco Barberini. And he wants the Knights of St. John to please him in everything. So he arrives in Malta, becomes a grand cross, 
and is even, after some insistence and a lot of kicking and screaming by much more deserving knights, he actually is put in command of the fleet, which is absolutely mad. I, I can imagine in, in real life situations, they must have had such a hard job keeping him out of mischief and not uh, causing too much harm. But the reason he comes into our story is that two important scholars are sent out with him. And that is the Athanasius Kerr, who we mentioned earlier, and uh, Lucas Holst, who had helped this uh, Friedrich Landgraf of Hess in his journey of conversion. So Kierkegaard, again, uh, immensely famous. He's a rising star at this point, and eventually when he returns to Rome, after you know, less than 10 months, he uh, sets up a very famous museum in the um, Jesuit College in Rome, which becomes a obligatory stop to anyone interested in, in the arcane in Rome. And he's also a very prolific publisher, and eventually he publishes a description of the visit to the cave, which happens on the arrival of uh, Friedrich, when uh, the uh, inquisitor, the prince, Lucas Holst and Kirker are hosted by Grand Master Lascaris at uh, Verdala Palace. He takes them for a little outing to that cave where he demonstrates how different and alien they are. And, and this is where this discourse of exoticization comes in. The way they're described in Kierkegaard's account, we, and, and because that account had such a, an impact, many people imagine that these were a very isolated community speaking a different language who did not mix at all. So it comes as a surprise when we see research done more recently, which has shown that there was a lot of intermarriage with uh, other communities in the surrounding, and that in some ways they were no different to other troglodyte communities uh, living in Malta. It was just a clever way to manage climatic conditions. But this uh, purist exoticization and this idea that they spoke an unadulterated form of Arabic is a tendency which uh, Abela is also going to challenge the question. And the other figure who comes out with uh, Friedrich is um, Lukas Holst. And you can see there a quick roll call of his accomplishments. He um, is often referred to as Il Gentil Uomo del Cardinale. He's the most trusted man of Cardinal Barberini. He also takes care of his library. He becomes librarian to Queen Christ Christina of Sweden upon her conversion to Catholicism, which happens when uh, Fabio Chigi has become the Pope Alexander VII. It's one of the first big events in his papacy. And eventually, he becomes custodian of the Vatican Library. And he is in Malta for about 10 weeks. And although these people may have been acquainted, you know, Kiji and Kirchner and Holst uh, in Rome, in the period that they spend in Malta, they get to know each other much better. And of course, Abela is part of their circle. And they form lifelong friendships uh, in, in this period. So that's almost the whole cast of characters. And one of the things we're going to look at at the moment is some of the letters between these people and some insights we may glean. Now, what do you do if you're stuck on a small island in 1637? How do you entertain yourself? Giovanni Francesco Abela, in this period, has already started his project of setting up a small collection, an antiquarian collection, which is the most important collection of antiquities in Malta by far at this point. And you see it in the, we're in the innermost basin of the Grand Harbor here. This is a map from, of some harbor works in the late 18th century, but it's one of the most clear records of the position of his house. It's that pink building near the center, 
with a garden around it. Now, the garden is not incidental to the creation of a museum in the early 1600s. And I'll come back to gardens in a moment. But thanks to Fabio Chigi's diary, we have a very intimate record of the interaction between these people, all the comings and goings, where uh, Kiji would record that on a particular Sunday he went by boat to the um, Casino San Giacomo, uh, the museum built by Abela in Marsa. Because nowadays you might say, why Marsa, of all places? But uh, it was, it certainly had none of the heavy industry it has today. Beautiful vistas down the harbour. So if you could choose your site, and Abela was certainly in a position to, to, to choose, that was uh, a grand location and within easy reach of Valletta and his offices in Valletta. So there's a great deal of interaction happening by boat and even Kiji records people giving uh, lifts to each other in uh, uh, getting back home after a day discussing antiquities. And there are many conversations we will never retrieve but these people were sharing ideas and probably arguing and thinking about each other's uh, viewpoints of the world. So, Kiji, Holst, and their worldview is something which our Abela is certainly aware of and thinking about. And these are some of the pieces in, in, uh, in Abela's collection, which are also represented, yeah, the images you see there, were eventually uh, illustrations in um, the 1647 description of Malta, because the collection and the book work hand in hand in this period. It's absolutely vital to collect the evidence and then to build your case and give your narrative, quoting that um, uh, evidence to support your arguments, you know? Each one without the other is incomplete. And I said I'd come back to gardens. I'm going to show you three of the most famous examples of uh, antiquarian collections in Rome. This is Villa Borghese, you know, which from uh, the papacy of uh, Pope Paul V, I, I'm just a little earlier, where again, the cardinal nephew, Scipione Borghese, assembled an extraordinary collection of antiquities and even modern sculpture, like Bernini sculptures. And you can see that the garden is an integral part of it. And antiquities would also be displayed in the garden. And you can even see to the left uh, an obelisk, uh, which uh, you will not see today. Sorry, I started with Villa Medici, apologies. That, that obelisk was carted away by the Medici family uh, and it is now in the Boboli Gardens in Florence. That's why you don't uh, see it there today. So, uh, uh, Villa Medici is one example of antiquities embedded in gardens. And, uh, Villa Borghese, same formula. With modern by the way, and uh, in Palazzo Barberini, which is the new pile by uh, the Pope and his nephew, who we have already introduced, yeah, Maffeo and Francesco Barberini, also had its obelisk, which you can see on the left. But uh, it was eventually uh, moved to the Pincio in this case. It's, it's uh, no longer there. But the design that we saw for the obelisk that we saw uh, early on in the presentation when we were looking at Santa Maria Sopra Minerva, you may have noticed the obelisk on an elephant, yeah, which is a design by Bernini, and that was put up in, during the papacy of Alexander VII, so much after his visit that day. But that design was originally made for uh, this example, but never executed here. and Francesco. So, 
having introduced those characters in the setting of the garden, I'm going to just look at a couple of quick examples from the correspondence between uh, these individuals. So after Holst uh, returns to Rome, going by the sea route, he um, arrives to find a whole pile of letters waiting uh, for him, and some of them are from uh, uh, Fabio Chigi in Malta. And he answers, and he starts by apologizing. Uh, yes, actually, need to look at the screen more often to, to get this in the right order. Actually, uh, yes, this is, this is early in Fabio Chigi's uh, stay in Malta. There's another longer letter to his father's cousin, Agostino Chigi, which was published by Monsignor Borge, which is a beautiful record of his archaeological observations. This is a much lesser known unpublished letter where there's a little gem, though, it's his first uh, April in Malta, and that's you know that's a period when the light is especially bright. And look how he's describing it to this person who he can be informal with. This was something of a mentor to him. Yeah? Costino Kichi is one of the relatives he feels closest to, and so. Uh, if I had ever wished in the past to receive a letter from you, now I'm especially missing your letters. That's what he's saying here. I'm here in this corner of Barbary, you know, which is usually used for North Africa, in the middle of the sea. And because the days are longer than other regions, <coughs> they are imprisoning us inside our houses. And it's not just us foreigners. It's even the natives, and not just imprisoned inside our houses, but in the darkest recesses of our houses. So there's this whole idea, firstly, that we are in Barbary. Yeah? And it, it chimes with what we were saying earlier about the idea of Outremer, of being beyond Europe and uh, in the territory of um, the Crusades and, and the infidel and uh, beyond. And it's being uh, repeated here. And remember, this is no lightweight. He is a first-class scholar, as we've already seen. So to be making this judgment is very interesting. And another example is uh, the... Yes, this, this is when Holst has uh, got to Rome and finds the letter waiting. We don't have Hull's letters, unfortunately, but we have, uh, we, sorry, we don't have Kiji's letters, but we have Hull's replies, because Kiji, being very organized <coughs> and methodic, as we've seen, uh, archived all the letters he received. And uh, he's saying, uh, after those 10 weeks on the island, I needed a break. In Orondito, I was just so horrified by the uh, being exposed to these naked rocks of Malta and uh, the dangers of the Libyan Channel and, uh, and then Shilad Karpitis on the way back up. So again, there's this construction. And again, this is another first-rate scholar constructing Malta as remote and um, beyond uh, Europe. In every sense. And this also reminds us of uh, a few generations earlier, the first description, the first published description we have of Malta by Jean Quintin, published in Lyon in 1536 and translated by Horatio Vella in 1980, has some of the same observations. And uh, it was only recently I I went back to it and realized that he's already making the point about the brightness of the light. Yeah? You, see, you see here Professor Vella's uh, translation. The sun's blaze reflected from the dazzling whiteness. I also need to keep in mind that this is a period of, in very, not so much uh, Jean Quintin, but certainly when Kiji is here at Holst, there's a great amount of building going on, which can only have made this worse. 
Yeah, there's uh, the Ferenc water lines being built and uh, Valletta still quite new. So that would have further accentuated this. Now this brings me back to Abela's project. And I'd like to unpack the frontispiece. Now, you know, the frontispiece is that very elaborate image which uh, you would find in uh, books of the 1500s, 1600s and 1700s. And a great deal of effort would be invested in a frontispiece. It is, as you see in this quote from a study which is entirely dedicated to frontispieces, this is a whole branch of science in its own right, is that it is the epitome of the epitome, the microcosm of the microcosm. So a good frontispiece must sum up the entire message of the book. Now, Abela's frontispiece, as we said, is uh, an extremely uh, familiar image. And so what I'm going to try to do now is a bit of defamiliarization and trying to think of the process that went into its invention. And uh, although it follows some conventions, it is also an extraordinary and highly original composition and loaded with meaning. Now, the idea of uh, an architectural composition is uh, extremely popular at this time because it's meant to read as a doorway into the book. Okay, that's the basic idea. And uh, the frontispiece, by the way, is uh, designed by the hand of an important architect, Francesco Bonamici, who's also in the circle of uh, Van Gokigi. And at the time that this is being created, it had already been in Malta for over a decade. Okay? So there's plenty of opportunity for conversations between Abela and Bonamici. They're certainly designing this together. I think of it as a cohort. And as an architect, he certainly would have been aware of works like Palladio, right? the um, uh, four books of architecture, and so many other architectural treatises, which is and then another book which may have been in the background here of uh, Abela's mind is one published by Ulisse Aldrovandi, who was a very important naturalist and geologist in Bologna. And he passes away in 1605 when uh, Abela is there as a student. And it must have had left quite an impact on him. And this book, uh, the first edition, is published in 1616. And, uh, the library has a copy of it here, which is quite magnificent. Again, the portal, and you can see a glimpse. This is about four-footed animals with solid hooves, and you can see a glimpse of them through the doorway. Yeah? So it's meant to be drawing you in through the book, through the, through the doorway, into the book, into the contents of the book. That's why they're positioned.